sorry. <laughs> I feel pinned in in this little area here. <laughs> um, I'm Pastor Corey, one of the pastors on staff at Legacy. I'm also uh, doing a church plant for the United Methodist Church called Mission Bismarck, where we connect uh, people in the community with uh, making the community better for Bismarck. And so I, I do both those things, and I help out where I'm needed. And so this morning, I'm happy to give Andy some time off, uh, even though he's, he's here. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure he understands this time off thing very well. <laughs> so when I came into the building, uh, I felt something, which is great, because the, ser the series we're in, What the World Needs Now, which all I can think of is a Beatles song, um, is is talking about the community. And my subject this morning is talking about conflict. And when I came in this morning, I felt the conflict. It, it is thick in this room. Can you feel it? Can you feel the conflict building in this room? There, is, there are two sides to this conflict. There is one side that is for a certain team playing today, <laughs> right? And then on the other side is this buildup of this other team that's playing today. This conflict is coming together. And I heard whispers of, who are you rooting for? Who uh, can I be friends with you if you don't like this team? <laughs> right? So it, it is, so who's playing today? Eagles. I'm sorry? Eagles. The Eagles? Right? And they play for what city? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Right. And then, who, and then who's playing? Kansas City Chiefs. Kansas City Chiefs. Well, a lot more people answered that quickly. So either you really like them or you don't. Right? And there's this conflict. And I feel the conflict because I'm actually right here in the middle. When people ask me, can I be friends with you? Who are you rooting for in the Super Bowl? I say, I don't like football. <laughs> They're like, no, I cannot be friends with you because you don't like football. Why don't you like football? Because it's too violent. And then they're not sure what to say to that because they know it's true. There's conflict all around us. All you need to do is pull up the news, right? doesn't matter what news station you look at, what you read, what you listen to. There is conflict all around us. For some reason, balloons are a big deal right now, right? Uh, there is conflict going overseas. There is conflict going on in uh, this country, within this city. There is conflict everywhere. And I think maybe it's time we talk about conflict. But the conflict that I'm going to talk about this morning is very specific. It is the conflict that happens within the faith community. Because our Christianity was meant to be lived in community. We are supposed to live out our faith, supposed to live out our love for God in community, not individuals. Our culture is very individualistic, in case you hadn't noticed. Some of you in your bathrooms, or in your grandparents' bathrooms more than likely, there's a poem. And that poem is Footprints in the Sand. It is so beautiful. There are two sets of footprints going in the sand. And then troubles of earth happen. And now there's just one set of footprints. What happened to the other prints? Well, that's where Jesus picked you up and carried you. Isn't that sweet? But it's wrong. It is so, so wrong. Because our faith, the Christian community was built, not with two sets of footprints, yours and Jesus's, but that sand of that beach is covered with footprints. Thousands of footprints. So if I'm walking down that beach, all of your footprints are on there too. All of Legacy North, every church, every believer in this community of Bismarck and I suppose Mandan, uh, together <laughs> are walking on that beach together. One set of footprints disappears because life got hard and Jesus had to carry me, but you helped too. We live our Christian lives in community, not individually. Don't let culture warp your mind in that. There is no John Wayne of Christianity. I'm going to do this by myself with my six shooters. It doesn't work that way. We do it 
together. If some of you are quite young to know who John Wayne is. Just ask an older person, they'll know. <laughs> they'll know. So conflict within the Christian community. I know it never happens, <laughs> right? Yeah, you've never seen that before. You know, there's only, what, 45,000 different denominations? That's a real number, by the way. 45,000 different denominations. There is conflict within the community. But how do we handle it? How do we handle it when there's conflict? When I was in seminary, there was a room that had a fireplace and two overstuffed chairs. It was a room that we could get away as students and just relax, get away from academia. I don't know if you've ever been to a master's or level or above PhD level, but those professors just drive you nuts. They are so smart. They are so smart. And they just, they look down on the rest of you. Anyway, so you get into that room to get away from all of that. But occasionally, two of those professors would take their lunch break in that room. And each would get a comfy seat. And they would begin to talk. See, there were two points of theology that they disagreed on. They disagreed on. And they would talk about it. They would discuss. They would animate and then their voices would get higher and higher. And us, it was like eating. It's like we would hand out popcorn. We'd sit on the floor like little kids cross-legged, and we'd watch this happen. We'd watch these two titans of academia discuss a theological point. And we loved it. It was so awesome to watch them go to battle over this. And then the discussion would come to an end. And then what happened? We'd wait to see how this was going to end. Two professors would struggle up out of their chair, and they'd look at each other, and they'd give each other a big hug, and say, let's go get lunch. You see, they disagreed vehemently on a point. And to you and me, it's not, it doesn't make or break anybody's faith, the point. When they were done, they weren't enemies that drew lines, threw words and rocks at each other. They were in a community of believers. And they would hug each other, walk off, continue on. Continuing to disagree, but not letting that come between them. The reason is this, because when you disagree with someone within the faith community, when you disagree with someone within the faith community, when you will disagree with somebody in the faith community, you need to understand two things. Two things you have to keep in mind. The two important things. The first is who you are. Who are you? Not what you do, not your titles, not what you went to school for, or your family lineage, none of that. Who are you? You are someone whom God has chased since the moment that you were in your mother's womb. God has called to you. God has tried to bring you to him in his love and his grace, has pulled you to him. He has, from the time you were born and you were a child and you were naughty, you know when you got cold in your stocking, you remember that? Or maybe you should have. Remember that? He was still calling you. He still loved you. He still wanted you. That time when you were a teenager and you did the exact opposite. Where's Spencer? You did the exact opposite <laughs> of of what your parents wanted. You were naughty, and yet God still called you. He wanted you. He pulled you to you. And then that day came when you accepted him, when you surrendered your life to him. You started down the path of faith, and then you tripped, and your knees got bloody, and you fell off the path. And Jesus came along, picked you up, dusted you off, and you kept going until you tripped again, and again, and again, and over and over again. Jesus wants you. He's nuts about you because there's nothing that you can do that would drive him away. It's not action-based. He loves you. You are a child of God. Nothing can take that away. You have to know who you are before you go into a conflict. Secondly, you have to know who you're in conflict with. You have to know who they are. You know who they are? They are someone who Jesus has been chasing since they were in their mother's womb. Do I need to say it all again? <laughs> they are someone who God loves. When they fell, they still called. Jesus still called their name. 
Jesus still wants them when they fall and trip and bloody their knees and pick them back up. They are children of God, whether it's one or a group that you're in disagreement with. You need to know two things when you go in. Who you are, a child of God. Who they are, a child of God. A child has a father. And there's times where Jesus would pray and he would look up to heaven just exasperated with the people around him and he would say, Abba! Abba. Now that doesn't mean anything to us. Abba. But in early Aramaic, Abba means daddy. It means daddy. It is a tender, loving word. It doesn't mean father and all of its baggage, but it means daddy. Daddy. You are a child of God. And those that you're in conflict with are children of God too. And we have the common Abba, Daddy. Now Jesus was no stranger to conflict. Everywhere he went, there seemed to be conflict, either uh, because of others or because he was saying. And the reason why there was always conflict around Jesus is because Jesus was causing change. Because we love change, right? <laughs> change itself causes conflict. And so Jesus was constantly rubbing up against others who were uh, at odds with him. So there was a time, and if you want to follow along in your Bibles, it's Luke chapter 10. And if you don't have your Bibles, you've got it memorized. That's cool. I'm proud of you. So Luke chapter 10, we're starting with verse 25. Jesus is out teaching, and one of the experts in the law comes up and asks him a question. Now, an expert in the law is just that, is someone who knows the Torah, knows the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. If you know a Jewish person and you want to make them mad, call it the Old Testament. Because to them it's their Bible. All right? So the Torah. They know it inside and out, so they know the boundaries. They are the experts. They know it. So this expert in the law wants to, wants to rub Jesus the wrong way, wants to create some friction, wants to create some contention. So he finds Jesus, we pick it up at verse 25. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? He throws it back at him. Jesus is so classic with that. Throws it back at him. The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. This is the boiled down basics of all <laughs> of the Torah, of all the law, of everything. This is boiled down to its very basic. Love God with everything you have. And love your neighbor as yourself. It is these two pillars that we stand on. And this becomes the basis for Christian behavior and lifestyle. You do know, right, that Christianity is a lifestyle that's different from the world, right? You do know that, right? It's very different from how the world acts, behaves, and believes. This becomes the basis. Jesus, if you want to have the unpacking of this, then read the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus then unpacks what this means in detail, like loving enemies and stuff. So if you dare, read the Sermon on the Mount and what this means. So when we go into conflict as a faith community, we go into conflict, we have this basis as our, this base for our standard of behavior. It is our guardrails. We love God with all that we have, and we love others as ourselves. Knowing that you are a child of God and knowing that the person that you're in contention with is a child of God. It changes our behavior a bit, doesn't it? Our, cult, our current culture is a cancel culture. Part of it is cancel culture. We don't cancel anyone. Our world uh, tells us to build fortifications 
build ammunition, collect ammunition, and then shoot it at our opponent. As Abba's children, that's not what we do. We act, live, and believe differently. So how do we do this? I'll give you two basic tools to do this, okay? Now, obviously, I'm giving a broad brushstroke. This does not encompass every situation you're going to come across. This isn't going to encompass everything. Do you have a couple years to talk about this? Because there's just too many options and what ifs. Okay? But there's two basic things I'm going to give you. The first is this. You have to listen. Now, we think we know what it means to listen. Most of the time when we listen, we hear someone say what they're going to say, their argument or their side, and before they're done, we start to formulate in our minds our response. We start to think about it. We formulate words that we're going to say back. And when we start to do that, we know we're no longer listening. Or we're half listening. Active listening involves paying full attention to whoever is speaking, and then at the end of their sentence, you say, this is what I heard. And then you say it back. I would say 60% of the time, you didn't hear it right. Because each of us has baggage. Each of us has things that cause us to hear and understand words differently. Different words. Each of you in this room, if I was to say the word father, it means something different to some of you. Maybe you didn't have a father. Maybe your father was a jerk. Maybe you had a wonderful father. And so when someone has an argument and uses a word that has different meanings based on your baggage and your experience, you're going to understand it differently. So speak it back. I heard you say this. Is that correct? No, that's not what I said. What I meant was, and then the dialogue goes from there. Active listening. Now, not only does this work for working through, reconciling through disagreements, but if you want your marriage to last, just saying, guys, you know, if you, want, if you really want to make an impression on your partner, actively listen. After they faint, right, you pick them back up and say, uh, so explain to me again what I didn't hear correctly. <laughs> and go through it, okay? The second is this, and that is have an open, curious mind. The way I do this, so I learned early in conflict management and in disagreements within the body, within the community, that I had a problem with associating myself with my ideas. I would present an idea to a board and they would shoot it down. I know that never happens to any, you know, any of you. None of your ideas get shot down, but mine did. And I had a problem because I associated my idea with myself. So when they shot my idea down, I thought they were shooting me down. And I had to learn early to disassociate my ideas from myself. They didn't like my idea, but they still liked me. Yay! That's so much better. But what, how, here's how I learned how to do that. This is how I learned how to, how to have a keep an open, curious mind. When I get into a situation where there's conflict within the body, I put on a lab coat in my mind. I don't actually say, hold on one second. Okay. Because <laughs> a lab coat is a scientific coat. It is a, is a scientist you ask questions, you explore, you go through each and every avenue to find out, to discover what the truth is. And you do it dispassionately and distantly. Because your goal is to be curious. Your goal is to listen. Your goal is to discover. Not to get embroiled emotionally and allow yourself to be stomped on, which is so easy, but rather to keep a distance. Sorry, your guitar is out of tune now. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Uh, the, to keep yourself distant from it and be curious. 
Be open. Have fun with it. Be adventurous. Ask good questions. Why? Because you are a child of God. Your opponent that you're against, and don't even think of as your opponent, the person who has a disagreement with you, is a child of God. And the Abba Father expects you to act like one of his kids. To live, to serve, to disagree in love, in grace, in understanding. Which is very different than how the world doesn't get along. You are children of God. Act like it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you fill this space with your love, with your forgiveness. May you be a healing balm in our lives. Help us to act and live out the love that you so freely give us. Help us to be your children. We ask this in your name. Amen.